the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestsellers, all they're hyped up to be. The Terrible Book Club explores whether or not you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. If you've ever seen a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Hello and welcome to episode 148 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Chris and this is Paris. Hello. This time we read Man Fuck This House by Brian Asman and I always have to read it that way. I can't just read it like Man Fuck This House. It's Man Fuck This House. No, it's uh, yeah, in my mind it's Man Fuck This House. <laughs> like and yeah, it it has a certain affectation for sure. Yeah. As we said, this is by Brian Asman. Ball ass man. This was recommended to us by our patron Will. So thanks, Will. Double thanks for your picks actually being enjoyable spooks generally. Because last time he picked Universal Harvester for us to read, which was similar in like good and mildly spooky. Yeah, I cannot tell you, Will, how much I appreciate you recommending us books that we actually end up liking. Like, sincerely thank you because. You know, we got to come up for good book error every now and again. Like, it's it's hard reading, like, oh, boy, another hero's journey fantasy or, oh, another romance where everything works out perfectly. It's real hard on the old book bones. So thank you, Will. We <laughs> we appreciate it. Um, I guess that's a spoiler. We uh, we actually enjoyed this. We enjoyed Man Fuck This House. Um, if this is your first time listening to this show, what we do here at the Terrible Book Club is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination of the three. Uh, sometimes, like today, though, we read books that our patrons, friends, or listeners recommend. Uh, so generally, we do the opposite of what most people do, where we actually try to find books that we won't like and then review them. Uh, but once in a while, we actually, you know, end up liking them. We have our little book tables turned on us, and oh, how the how the turns have tabled on this day. Uh, for our content warnings, uh, I think we mostly just got barnyard language today. We do have uh, some discussion or mention of like action movie level violence, a little gore. We've got demonic children, ghosts, uh, haunted houses, mental health struggles, and possession. Uh, if you, like me, have grown up in New England living in houses that make you say man fuck this house this episode might be a little triggering to you uh so usually our reasons are very different because they're just old ass houses that have problems and not the haunted kind i mean little at column a little at column b <laughs> sometimes you get both uh anyway we're, yeah we're definitely gonna have to have a discussion later on about haunted house housing <laughs> cost value and how that <laughs> comes into play here yeah. Um, all right, Chris, do you want to read the back of the book summary just so our listeners get a little bit of a flavor of what, what the book's intentions are? Indeed. Sabrina Haskins and her family have just moved into their dream house, a gorgeous craftsman in the rapidly growing southwestern city of Jackson Hill. Sabrina's a bored and disillusioned homemaker. Hal's a reverse mortgage salesman with a penchant for ill-timed sports analogies. Their two children, Damien and Michaela, are bright and precocious. At first glance, the house is perfect, but things aren't what they seem. Sabrina's hearing odd noises, seeing strange visions. Their neighbors are odd or absent, and Sabrina's already fraught relationship with her son is about to be tested in a way no parent could ever imagine. Because while the Haskins family might be the newest owners of 4596 James Circle, they're far from its only residence. All right, and for our characters and setting, we pretty much got the rundown there from the back of the book, but there's a couple others that uh, pop up here. We got Sabrina Haskins, mom, Hal Haskins, dad, Damien Haskins, the Stewie Griffin stand-in <laughs> slash son, uh, Michaela Haskins, the voice of reason slash daughter, Zephyr, the lady next door, 
the house, which appears as its previous owner, Dirk Perryman, to Sabrina and other Haskins family members. It can also take on some other forms sometimes as well, but that's the main personification. And some cops. Yeah. Um, All right. So I'm going to take you through our summary of the main plot points so that it is um, at least obvious, like what happened in the story so that when we're talking about stuff, it's not as confusing, uh, hopefully. (laughs) The Haskins family has moved into the house at 4597 James Circle. It seems great. They immediately get up to their usual business. Hal is working, Sabrina is a stay-at-home mom, Michaela is a typical 12-year-old girl, and Damien puts on a creepy show in order to frighten his mom just because he thinks it's funny. However, Sabrina begins to see strange things, like a man suddenly appearing at the top of the basement stairs and bringing a box down for her. Food is made without her making it. Despite the cable not being hooked up, she can watch TV, starring herself in uncomfortable pastiches of daytime American TV. Sabrina begins to question her sanity. Meanwhile, Damien sees his mother unraveling and decides it's a great time to be extra weird. However, he's also receiving mysterious text messages claiming he's being watched, asking him what his plans are, and Damien chooses to ignore them and decides to buy two canisters of pig's blood and various occult-looking stuff to finally push his mom over the edge. The final push comes when Damien's mom-scaring pentagram and blood ritual pushes the house into action. Turns out it has been personifying itself in the form of the previous owner, Dirk Perryman, which has the ability to interact with the real world. This personification attacks Damien, kills a neighbor who was also a house personification, forcing Sabrina to choose between the house and her family. During this confrontation, the house uproots itself from its foundation and begins walking through town as the police do the only thing they know how to do, shoot at it wildly. Sabrina is caught in the crossfire while Damien and Michaela escape to safety. In an epilogue, we see the house has settled down in some other location, hiding amongst other houses, with some version of Sabrina, either as a house demon or a house-repaired person, residing inside. All right. All right, well, uh, yeah, let's, let's talk. Let's talk. Uh, what, what was good about this, Chris? What was good? I would say that this is a fantastic example of good pacing. It's Mm -hmm. just short enough to kind of keep you rooted to the spot where you're reading because you're like, I can finish this in one sitting, and usually you probably will. Um, Where There's never really a dull moment. Things keep moving forward. Only the necessary stuff doesn't linger on anything that it doesn't have to. Yeah. And still gives you a little bit to chew on regarding each character, despite the fact that this is clearly sort of, like I said, like a one sitting kind of a thing. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean... It's 158 pages. Honestly, it felt it it felt even faster than that reading it because it was so intriguing. Uh, yeah, pacing's great. I really feel like there was only one. I think there were two scenes that I was like, Meh, I don't know if we needed them, but that was towards the end, and they were only like two pages long. So I'm not gonna sit here and be like, Oh man, you really need to cut those four pages. Like it was is totally fine. <laughs> I just those are just the only points where I was like, yeah. Did we need that? You know. Um, but yeah, and man, the characterizations, I know you just talked about how we really got to chew on each character and we got the characterizations were just mwah, fucking chef's kiss. Yeah. And not a lot, not a huge portion size either. Right. Like we've got only a handful of chapters to be with these characters and still you get a clear indication of who each person is, which kind of runs against, you know, some other perhaps schools of thought where like, oh, we really got to settle in with these characters. It needs to be a slow burn for you to like really, really understand them. And while we're not getting like extreme amounts of depth here, I think each member of the Haskins family is clearly outlined with a specific personality, right? Like, Oh, they're like, they're of... in full color. I feel like I could yeah. see each of these characters perfectly in my mind. They felt real to me. Um, I'm actually going to, I'm going to read two of the characterizations we get right up at the start of the, of the book, just so you can get a sense for what we're talking about. Shortly after lunchtime, a beige Toyota Camry took a long, lugubrious left into James Circle, the back end sagging from the combined weight of the Haskins family and what worldly possessions weren't left for the movers. This is it, team! Hal Haskins said brightly. Hal was a man whose personality favored his car's paint job, prone to dad jokes and bland observations. His hobbies included checkers, Roth IRAs and assorted flavors of sports ball, his word. Even played a little sports ball too when his trick me allowed it. I 
feel like I know exactly who fucking Hal Haskins is after right. that so paragraph I, a, or it was like three sentences and I'm like that's yup. a fairly direct way to characterize right you're just telling the reader who that is but it's not so on the nose that you've the descriptions that it chooses right like the the Roth IRA thing and dude, dude, dad a man, jokes a dad being the personification of a beige Toyota Camry is like Mwah, fucking yes, right? I know like exactly. that's the kind of writing where look, that's the kind of snappy writing you want there. Where the like again, there's these associations that you make based on certain words and phrases that are used. When you see a think about a beige Toyota Camry, there's all sorts of conclusions you're drawing already, and that's yeah. exactly what this writer is exploiting. Yeah, I just I love that. Um, and then, so right right off the bat, I was like, oh, yeah, I love this. Oh, the long, lugubrious left. Oh, yeah. Mm, give me those. Give me those tasty adjectives and that alliteration right in the right spot. Oh, so good. It's like, get, this book was like getting a little book massage. Like, I just reset all of our little <laughs> sad book muscles that are over. We're just so tight with terrible <laughs> books over the time we've been bearing the weight. And finally, we got a nice sit down, cucumbers over the eyes or whatever they do. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, I'm also going to read a slightly longer passage that follows shortly thereafter describing Sabrina, who is the character that we spend the most time with anyhow. Uh, But I thought this introduction to her was, was really great. Sabrina was excited, even if the kids couldn't be bothered. She'd always thought of Columbus as a stop on the way to bigger and better things. But after dropping out of Ohio State mid-sophomore year to pursue her real passion, getting groped by hot sauce fingered rednecks at Hooters, she'd gotten stuck there. Then she'd met Hal, who came in one night with his co-workers for a plate of mild wings and exactly two beers. Maybe they hadn't fallen in love, per se, but he was a good guy with a steady job, selling reverse mortgages to widows. Part of her always figured something would change. What specifically she couldn't say, and then life would be somehow different, more exciting, more interesting. But it hadn't. Four years in Columbus turned into 14. Two kids, stretch marks, a series of part-time jobs, and aborted stints at community college. Sabrina literally tried to get into basket weaving. Basket weaving. Her other recurring nightmare involved becoming the world's foremost weaver of baskets, basically the Martha Stewart of basketry, flying off to Paris or Dubai at a moment's notice to weave a basket for some foreign dignitary or oil sheet. Becoming famous was one thing, but becoming famous for something so gosh darn boring seemed like its own special kind of H.E. double hockey sauce. So when Hal came home from work one day and told her he'd been offered a big promotion but they'd have to move, she didn't even ask where. Columbus was a fine town, but she needed to change so badly anywhere would be an improvement. She'd never heard of Jackson Hill, but it was apparently one of America's most desirable small cities. Whataburger had even opened a franchise there the year before. Maybe it wasn't San Fran or Seattle or even the less murdery parts of St. Louis, but she kind of liked that. The whole city seemed like a blank envelope. Anything could be inside. She could reinvent herself, become whatever she wanted. If only she could figure out what that was. So to me, that is a... Quality stuff. Really good portrait of, you know, a mom who just kind of fell into the mom life without really taking time to consider what she herself wanted. It happens to a lot of people. And I just, yeah, I just thought that characterization was great. And the writing... Someone who gets pulled along by the tide of life. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, Yeah, and I mean, we'll continue to read examples as we go. Uh, So... I guess next we can talk about I'll I guess I'll just say quickly that the writing was great. I really loved the way that this, this was written. It was to the point. It was colorful without being, you know, without hanging on things too much or being too florid. Yeah, I I really loved the writing and like I said, we'll I guess we'll uh we'll give more examples as we go. Um but yeah, what's another what's another good thing about this book, Chris? I feel like this book is trying to be funny most of the time. It's not complete spook scares all the time kind of thing. And overall, the humor is morbid and uncomfortable in just the right way. The weird TV shows, generally anytime cops show up and fire indiscriminately at nothing or something. (laughs) Except for that one cop who was the only cop who has ever done a good job in any book we've ever read. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And then the final scene with the house completely uprooting itself was really, really good and entertaining. Yeah, like you like you said, it really had it really got out the measuring cups and spoons to get just like the right dash of this, the right well cup of this. Baked humor. Yeah, I mean here. it really like you said, it's more of an uncomfortable and funny, like, you know, in the passage I read about Sabrina where 
he slyly slips in like, oh, yeah, she quit college to do what she really loved, getting groped at Hooters. Like, cl- you know, and clearly he doesn't have to go into an elaborate explanation. You get the sense that, like, well, college wasn't working out and all she could really do was just keep working her job. Right. And he says that in a way that. Make, gives you a bit of an uncomfortable laugh, and that's kind of how this whole book is, and I really enjoyed the humor. It never got, like, it never got cringy to the point where you thought the author thought those cringy things, which is something that I think we encounter a lot in work where the, you know, an author is trying to work something in that, you know, to make a character, I don't know, displeasing or something, but they do it in such a ham-fisted way that it ends up feeling like the author actually thinks that and not the character. And it's just not, you know, it's not cleverly done. But I think in here, there, uh, we can talk about this a little later, but there's a character that says something shitty and another character comments on it. And it was like the perfect way to show that these types of shitty bigots exist, but to not give them space in the book, right? Like, Mm -hmm. which I think a lot of authors fall into the trap of where they're like, I just want to show the evil in the world. And then they're like, they end up glorifying it, you know, instead of. Yeah. Not that you necessarily need a character in the bigot scene, always like wagging a finger there or anything like that. But there's ways, and this is a shorter book. So I think that kind of works better here, Yeah, but there's ways to do that. I suppose finger wagging at that thing without seeming like, you know, this character is justified or, you know, you're perhaps tacitly endorsing that kind of a thing. And that line is very hard to tread sometimes. And I think, you know, our interpretations of where that line is can differ from anyone else's, certainly. Yeah. Um, but this book does make it very clear. What, like, the uncomfortable stuff is supposed to be uncomfortable and you're not necessarily supposed to be, you know, in line with certain shitty characters. Um, yeah. Like it, it So... Similarly, when we're talking about gray area stuff here, it's once again difficult for me to pinpoint why the absurdity in this is fine, but other times we call something too absurd. Like, right, you know, like the house uprooting itself and being a living thing that can walk. We're not, I never had this moment where it's like, well, how can it actually walk? It doesn't have a muscle structure or skeleton, it's just concrete. <laughs> you know, sometimes I think people that listen to the show might get on us for having that kind of a mindset but i don't know like something in here makes me go along with it as opposed and similarly with drag queen dino fighters right like we weren't really questioning too hard about any of the absurdity happening in there we weren't nitpicking believability but then when we get into something more like the sword of truth which has all these like magic deus ex machinas and stuff like that Mm -hmm. like the believability we tend to uh nitpick it more not nitpick but just question it more and i'm i'm having a hard time exactly saying what what is the difference in the tone is it just that sort of truth is trying very hard to be serious and setting up these stakes whereas these other things are deliberately silly and i'm willing to go along with it because they're explicitly trying to be humorous yeah i mean I, I, i think that's part of it i think you know the first part of this is like the general feel or genre of the work right is critical to what your expectations are going into it where in the sort of truth we're supposed to believe in all these kind of like real life cause and effect stuff like you know if colin gets stabbed or whatever she's gonna die right or if like richard gets his leg chopped off that's a fucking problem but then, like, there's always... They they treat everything with, like, the sense of urgency we would treat it with in the normal world, but then there's all of a sudden all these, like, magical fixes for things, and it doesn't even work within the magic system that they've created, like, the logic they've created. Um, So that's kind of... So that's part of it, right? Because if you're reading, I don't know, someone's, like, autobiography, and they're, like... I got into a car accident and then walked away. You'd be like, wait, what? Like if something is, something is setting you up for kind of regular, the regular physics and the biology of like <laughs> human, human experience on earth, you know, it's a little surprising when that doesn't happen and when it's not explained. But I think if you're reading something that is clearly going to be occult in nature and also funny, 
you expect things to be a little on the wackier side, so it's not it's not as jarring, right? Yes. Um, and also, I'm just going to go back to what I said in the Drag Queen Dino Fighters episode. The author has to convince me to suspend my disbelief. And Brian Asman in this book has me wrapped around his finger. Rich descriptions, humor that works, characters that feel real and have depth, a premise that is surprising and irreverent without being stupidly edgelord. I mean, he really, really hits all the notes that make me not care that I know that a house can't get up and run away. Because, like, the problem with a lot of other books we've read is we get so hung up on these details because the rest of it is so fucking flaccid and weak and lame that, like, all we can do is focus on the things that don't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> because nothing else is interesting and the author hasn't convinced us not to look at that thing that's obviously fucking weird. <laughs> it's you know? just standing in the middle of the room. Yeah. And they'd like to distract you from it, but nothing else that they're providing is an ample distraction. They're out here, like, waving around fight scenes and action <laughs> yeah. things and romance subplots I was like look over here don't notice the horrible grammar or the fact that Ugh. I'm just making up magic on the fly clearly. yeah yeah and it's, it doesn't work um yeah so I think again the author has to convince you they have to they have to pull you into their story and make you feel comfortable with the fact that this house is a very special type of possessed house that is a entity unto itself and it can act independently and you know what when it finally has too much it can literally uproot itself and run away on foundation legs like i i was totally you know when that happened i was like okay this is funny and then it continues to be funny because there's like scenes of cops just shooting wildly at a house that's running yeah away. that's pretty good i gotta like, say like when the really... house uproots itself for the first time you're like on board and it's funny as hell and then the fact that pretty much all the cops except i guess for that like lead oh. detective yeah they're only even the lead detective solution was to just fire at the house which like <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's made out of anything. mortar and aluminum side. Like, what are you even targeting as a weak point, guys? Like, what do yeah. you think? Like, you're going to yeah. need a bulldozer to, like, take out the foundation legs <laughs> minimally. Like, minimally yeah. call in the construction crews. I don't know what your, like, pellets are going to gonna do to it. Yeah, you guys got to get a bulldozer. Like, not a bulldozer, a, a wrecking ball. That's what you need. Um... <laughs> I mean, with, you know, police, like, budgets, maybe they have one on call, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, they have military grade fucking weaponry. You got all those RPGs and like grenade launchers in the back. For once, you have an f- excuse to use it. You're still using your pistols. Yeah, I know. Well, maybe Jackson Hill isn't as uh, well funded as some other. That's true. <laughs> some other departments. Um, well equipped. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, t- sorry, just to wrap this up again. I think Brian Asman does a, a brilliant job of convincing me to come into this demon house and hang out for a while um, and enjoy the story. Yeah. Um, Oh, yeah, I guess we can... I just wanted to read that line where um, we were talking just before this about how a lot of authors will try to include characters that or content that's, you know, supposed to be controversial or edgelordy you know evil guy stuff but then they end up either glorifying it or like doing it in such a lazy ham-fisted way that it is distasteful um Mm -hmm. and you know we've we've come up against this a lot where we've talked about how of course you know we're not at all saying that you can't have like evil or shitty or terrible people represented in works you just have to do it in a responsible way you can't you know, you can't just throw it in there and be like, oh, right, kids then, said a bunch uh, of slurs. It's like, well, that's not great, you know. And even when you do it semi-responsibly, you're still going to have a contingent of your audience that like, yes, I agree with the Joker and Tyler Durden and yeah. like all those characters, which are like very clearly to me supposed to not be someone that you idolize or worship or think is cool. But main character, <laughs> main character, good, Chris, always good. Main character, always friend. How dare you? 
Like, I don't, I never got, like, a sidebar here for a second, Paris, but, like, why do people think the Joker is cool when he's, like, basically the cringiest villain in the world? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Doesn't he, like, blow up hospitals? Like, why would anyone... Sure, depending on, like, what version of the Joker you're dealing with, he's either blowing up hospitals or doing literal, like, prank, like, water in the fucking flower lapel shit at Batman. But, like, still, like, he's he's a clown that sucks. Like, why, we don't already don't like clowns. Why are you trying to think, like, yeah... Posting memes with like we live in a society with the Joker on it. Ah, fuck well, in my in my really non expert opinion, uh, if I may, America has a really dumb obsession with male white male criminals because they think they're like masterminds, even though that is just clearly not the case. They're just fucking terrible people who do terrible things. I don't understand this whole like oh they're mastermind stuff. But I like, figured that's... out I could break the law and like it's the cops will come at me after and not during or something. So I figured out the system. I can actually shoot you and run away, and it will take everyone a while to figure out what happened. Yeah, or oh like my God. oh man, they got away with something for so many years, and it's like they weren't masterminds. Our criminal justice system is fucking broken it's not like it's, it wasn't <laughs> them they were just like oh yeah i can get away with stuff therefore i will do the stuff and get away with it for a time Espe- yeah especially like the joker's particular thing of like society is just a ramshackle series of agreements that we've all made it's like yes that's the social contract yes that is correct fucking yes. john Locke wrote this shit down a while ago <laughs> guys like yeah i don't understand why and it's like it's like you just stated the definition of something therefore you feel like you've unlocked the secret and you've now undressed it as invalid and it's like that's like saying a salad is just a combination of vegetables that you have put out of the ground rinse chopped up and put a dressing on <laughs> like oh yeah that sure is buddy i uh, figured salads, it all out salads I are good it all out just gonna keep eating them i don't see what i mean you with your Stupid food on a plate. Yeah, honestly, I, how, meanwhile. How, how does pulling the, the component parts out of something and defining it suddenly make it not real? I don't know. but uh, <laughs> Okay, sorry for that tangent there, but we could move on. But just, I hate that shit when people are I like, I figured it out. Yeah, and actually, uh, I can reconnect this back to this book. I, I mean, this is honestly a trait that, unfortunately, Sabrina, I guess ostensibly our main character, um expresses because she thinks that her son Damien she really thinks he's like the kid from the omen kind of like it's never stated but he's painted that way and for the first chapter or two you know she's like oh he's just so creepy all he does is like he just stares off and like says one thing once in a while and you know you find out that he's just trying to fuck with his mom because he thinks it's funny because very early on he he overheard his mom uh, when he was little, talking about how when Sabrina was pregnant, Damien was actually a twin, but, uh, you know, the other twin had been absorbed in the womb, which happens. And so she called him like a cannibal and always thinks about him that way. Like he murdered her other child. And so he was like, at a very young age, you know, he's very precocious. He is a very smart young child. He decided he would just play into this because it was funny. And so... Sabrina really thinks her son is, like, an evil genius who, like, might kill someone someday. And then it cuts to a chapter where he's, like, you know, he, I don't know, he's, like, he he does something weird. Like, he just goes and, like, stands in a corner of the yard. But then you find out that he's actually playing Fortnite and he's, like, just a regular (laughs) kid. And he's just, like, oh, yeah, I just think it's funny to fuck with my mom. And he's just, like, a regular kid. He's a little smarter than a regular kid, but he's, he's just a fucking kid, you know? And so I liked that that was kind of on display where, you know, this this idea of like the ooh, the the evil, the evil mastermind is so strong that even this mother thinks about this, thinks this about her kid because she is like afraid of him and never addresses it. Like they never take him to like a therapist or anything. She's just like, I don't know. He's just mysterious. It's like he's your 10 year old son. Like, <laughs> fuck. so. Uh yeah, so that I don't know. I thought that was a, a pretty good um take on the whole like demonic child thing. It was pretty funny. 
Yeah, you know, and I guess this is going to segue into, like, the one point I had under things that were bad, which I don't even really think is a bad thing. It's just my own mental image of this, which sort of took me out of it a little bit. I, as I mentioned up at the top when we were describing the characters, I just kind of kept picturing Damien as a Stewie Griffin type. Not literally that, because Stewie Griffin from Family Guy is a baby that is, like, an evil genius and actually hates his mom. But there was the sort of thing, like, where at the end of the story, Damien is being attacked by the house demon, and turns out he actually, you know, really does want his mother's love and protection in the end, which is sort of like the Stewie thing as well. He's, like, a big evil genius until he needs, like, his binky or some shit like that, and then he needs his mom. But, I don't know, I just kept picturing him as, like, a sort of grown-up version of that. And, like, it's not like this pastiche of, like, you know, child genius is is new or fresh or anything. We see that in all kinds of different ways. You know, you got your Dexter from Dexter's Lab or, like I said, Stewie Griffin and, I don't know, fucking Jimmy Neutron and shit like that. Although Jimmy Neutron oh, is more I mean, benevolent. Oh, I mean, let's talk about, I mean, Venture Brothers is, like, the opposite where you have, like, really yeah. dumb kids who are the children of uh, genius. So, I don't know, like, I, I just, that was the one point in the story where I was like, ah, I don't know about this, but that's such a very personal nitpick that I wouldn't call it about a bad thing about the story. It was just my own weird, like, headcanon for this kind of thing. So, I don't know. It's just a weird comment that I'm bringing up for I don't know what reason. Yeah, I, I thought I thought that the insertion of the, you know, demonic genius son was, like I said, actually really well done. I didn't. I didn't pick up on the Stewie Griffin thing until you said it. And I was like, oh, I guess. But I don't. Yeah, I don't think it's really like a. I certainly don't think it was based on Stewie Griffin or anything. like Yeah, that. no, no, definitely not. Um, because like I said, you know, even even when the kids do say cringy shit, it's done in a way that's, you know, actually, I have an example of um, Damien's teacher at school at the new school this is what i was talking about earlier sorry this is a little discombobulated i should have said it earlier but um you know he's giving you you're seeing snippets of the teacher lecturing at them about history and the teacher is doing a terrible job <laughs> um and damien's very smug and talking about like how stu how my god the teacher can't even say like the names right from this period of history um because he's talking about i think the um the persians and fighting you know it's like xerxes and stuff like that and he's making fun of the teacher like just in his mind just like oh my god i can't believe this guy he doesn't know what he's talking about and he's like oh, i gotta get out of here and so he like asks to go to the bathroom and the <laughs> teacher is like uh, like oh don't you want to know who won the battle and Damien's like it's sort of urgent need to go to the bathroom and the teacher goes all right spoiler alert the Persians defeated Leonidas's army but only because of this blasted gimp and Damien cringed at the cruel and offensive description of Faltes who might have been a traitor but didn't deserve such an ableist epithet and I was like that's a really that's a really good way to like show someone who's a bigot and not leave the reader to wonder if it's cool or not to be the bigot um you know because you have this horrible this teacher saying it's using this horrible term um and the kid's like oh jesus dude like yeah like, really even the 10 year old is a little like Ey. yeah maybe not maybe not a great plan um and then i think when they're in the he and his sister go to the horror you know the uh Halloween store, um, you know, the seasonal pop-up one that we all know and love. Um, and uh, they're, like, trying to decide what they want to be for Halloween. And um, they, I don't know. They were trying to get fake blood, and then they eventually end up getting, like, real pig's blood. But when they're at the store, um, they're talking through what they might want to be. And they <laughs> say... Uh, uh, the Haskins siblings had a long-standing Halloween tradition of wearing matching outfits. Over the years, they'd been Sid and Nancy, Ronald and Nancy, Jeff Galuli and Nancy. Damien enjoyed the latter one because he got to wear a sparkly figure skating outfit, and everyone at school looked appropriately horrified when a ski mask and mustachioed Michaela rushed out of the locker room and pretend smashed him in the knee with a telescoping baton. <laughs> the only problem was keeping their Halloween shenanigans. That word always made Damien giggle, secret from his parents, particularly Sabrina. Damien usually spent the earlier part of Halloween Eve standing silently in the corner or whispering creepy things to Sabrina like they're here before sneaking out to go trick-or-treating with his sister. 
What about Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell? Michaela asked, pausing in front of a rack of truly terrifying political masks. Damien cringed. Can't I go as someone who isn't named Nancy this year? Why? We're running out of Nancys. They're not the most notable people. Michaela's eyebrows knitted together briefly, then she smiled. We haven't done Nancy Grace and Casey Anthony. Will there be a blood-drenched baby doll involved? Duh. Damien stuck out his pinky. Deal. Michaela shook it. Now, let's not forget why we're here. Okay, so obviously, like, as adults, we all know that's terrible, cringy dialogue, but they are 10 and 12 years old, and they're intentionally trying to be provocative. So it makes sense, and it's obvious from reading it that, like, we're not supposed to be, we're not, like, celebrating this idea. It's obviously a terrible one, right? Like, you're, they're, I don't know. I Sorry, I'm lingering on this stuff because... I feel like it's a really it's a really great example of what we're always trying to get at people on this show, which is like yeah. you can show people being shitty, but there's a way to do it that doesn't direct the reader to identify with that shittiness. I think. Also, it's a great example of not only establishing that, but the repartee between Damien and Michaela, right? Right. Like the fact that they have this Halloween tradition that they're kind of keeping secret from their parents and they have their own bond that's separate from you know the the rest of the family life i guess you could say so it's you know two birds with one stone writing here yeah yeah i mean this this scene also serves to reveal that michaela and damien are actually just regular kids who go trick-or-treating and make stupid costumes and yeah they're a little i mean they're definitely on like the cringier side for sure and they're a little extreme but that's the point in showing that mm-hmm. yeah anyway i uh, just wanted to touch a little bit on on more stuff from the actual text uh yeah uh oh yeah while we're talking about stewie griffin just want to say yeah family guy in retrospect is fucking awful i, I hate it <laughs> i can't I, watch an episode of it anymore no i remember when it was on when i was a kid and um i remember my dad was excited because my dad really loved the simpsons i grew up watching the simpsons and um he was like yeah i think it's supposed to be kind of like that and i remember watching it with him and I don't know. I was never I was never into it, but a lot of other friends of mine were and then I hadn't even really thought about it, but somehow there was something I don't know if there was something I was watching or someone I don't know. I saw somehow came across a clip of it and I was like, "Holy fucking shit. How did anyone ever think this was funny? This is horrible." I mean, it's just it's just a bunch of insults back to back it's like not even really funny i don't i don't know kind of leans on accent humor a lot or like you know that kind of stereotyping of people thing and it's i you know what american dad is basically made by the same production company and does not lean so heavily onto that so i don't think it's necessarily a problem with like that studio it's more just the particular people that are writing for family guy or something yeah i don't i don't understand the uh, yeah like what the difference is but i feel like american dad is much better i i know i've watched some of those i don't know more recently certainly and i remember thinking they were pretty funny um but i don't know i I still haven't seen i still haven't seen american dad in like a couple of years but i remember it being funny and then like family guys just yeah i don't know i still can't it's bugging me because i can't remember in what context i saw a clip of it but i was like holy fuck was this really how the show was this is terrible Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um currently though i'm enjoying you know in the in the realm of animated shows for adults i've been enjoying bob's burgers um we've been that is a high quality show i gotta say bob's burgers is it hits that like king of the hill midpoint between where it's like a little serious and sometimes that might be like boring for some people but then like when you start like unraveling each character it like the the layers of funny get deeper yeah yeah king of the hill is a great reference that show is that show is, I feel like, underrated. That show is really funny. Um, I agree. At least from what I remember. That's another show I haven't watched in like 20 years. <laughs> but, All right. Well, this was TBC's adult animation corner for yeah. you here. Well, I guess I just wanted to say that uh, because we were talking about Stewie Griffin, we never we never actually talked about uh, how... I just wanted to make sure Family Guy was thoroughly denounced on this show <laughs> because... Yes. I, God, I just can't uh, believe that was popular. Anyway, um, moving on into, I mean, we kind of covered the good and bad of what this book was. So now we just have some sort of other stuff that pops up when you're reading this kind of book. Yeah, um, uh, there really wasn't. I don't think there was really anything bad about it, to be honest with you. Yeah, 
like Couldn't I said, agree. there were there were two really really short chapters at the end that I was like, man, I could have done without this. That was it. But it's fine. So for me, um, I was just kind of had trouble deciding whether House Monster is something fresh enough to call it, you know, really original or exciting like that. Um, the only thing I can think of that was like an actual house that was a monster or uprooting itself was the uh, Hell House enemy from Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> but you have listed many others. In yeah, the notes here. I mean, that's just some I could some I could think off the top of my head was um, House, the Japanese film. Um, and then most more recently, the Netflix series, The Haunting of Hill House and The Haunting of Bly Manor. Um, I mean, The Haunting of Hill House is based on the Shirley Jackson book by the same name. But um, I they were both a really good take on haunted house stuff, I thought. Especially Haunting of Bly Manor. I thought it was quite good. I was surprised. I wasn't expecting to like it. Um, but it was, it was good. Um, yeah, so I don't know. The idea of like, a house that has sort of a a will, I guess, you know? Um, yeah, that's certainly part of a lot of haunted house media. But I guess what I was specifically rooted on was the mobile haunted house. Mm. Yeah, like the, I don't... The haunted house that can walk around. Yeah, no, that I've never seen before. I've never seen a walking house. So that, to me, was original in this. Um, I mean, unless you're talking Baba Yaga, that's a really common... Sure, yeah, classic. That's classic a, walking house stuff there that's the only walking house uh i could think but of. that was like that's like baba yaga has control of the house it's not like right. the house's will is what is mobilizing it. yeah so yeah that's sort true. of a different twist that's true. on it that's true so perhaps this is this is uh yeah i i wasn't bothered by it i thought that this take on a haunted house was clever um you got some of the some of the usual tropes but then they kind of bend them a little bit which is always what i'm looking for you know you have like oh um, weird things are happening in the house, but it's not because there are ghosts trapped in there. It's because the house has yes. intention. And then you find out, like, not only does the house have intention and can do things, but it can also take the form of other people. I really like that when, you know, they sort of, like, whenever the house people were injured and the skin was peeled back somehow, it was just like, up two by four with a bunch of nails yes. in it underneath. <laughs> yes, it's really that's the part that's really funny, right? Because like, yeah. if you have a house reconstituting itself as a person and you hurt the house person, of course the inside is going to be like pencil shavings and nails and like fiberglass. Like that's fucking, that's fucking hilarious. I thought that was a great funny part of the book that I don't know, just gave you a little chuckle, you know. Yeah, speaking of that level of stuff, I mean, I've mentioned this before, but I don't think we're going for true scariness or horror in this book. It's got that goosebumps-ish type of silly horror where we're never too threatened by anything. Some of the later apparitions, though, are well-dressed in spooky descriptors. Like, there's a scene where the house being is taking the form of Sabrina and, like, the way it's sort of, like melting into itself and like reconstituting into the Sabrina form is a very well done sort of gross description of a monster. Yeah, I um I disagree with you quite a bit on this point. Um I don't think this is goosebumps ish at all. And I find the whole idea extremely threatening. Um <laughs> I personally like again, I think this is just even though uh, uh sorry, this is a quick digression. I was going to say, I think maybe that's just living in old New England houses my whole life. And I was going to say, I really love that this guy was like, yeah, we're going to do a spooky house and it's going to be in the Southwest. I was yeah, like, yes, once. thank you for my not setting this. Next flavor. It's haunted house. For <laughs> once. I fucking love Tex-Mex. You give me that, that tasty chips and guac in the walls. Um, <laughs> yeah. I was just like, so pleased that this was not set in new england because that's where <laughs> all haunted things happen only here only here only in the fall or winter perhaps usually the fall how do we like, get that monopoly like wh what do we do specifically besides have salem massachusetts be present what did we well, do to earn it's, that it's that it's also just that this is the <sighs> okay there's a lot of like contextual history i'm glossing over but i think what most people believe and have been served to them is that, like, well, this is where 
the country was founded. This is where all the old stuff is, you know? So, like, all the colonial shit's here from all the colonization. True. So, it's, like, all the leftover colonial ghosts. But when, meanwhile, there were, like, native peoples yes, throughout the everywhere. land before that could be plenty haunting the, the shit out of all of y'all for doing that. Yeah. And like, and, like, the other confusing thing about this is that, like, you rightly bring up, like, hey, there's been people here for fucking eons before, you know, the Euros got here. And, um... Yeah, what? Where's all? Why? Where's the hunt? I mean, maybe because there weren't there weren't as many permanent structures. But even then, like, are you telling me a haunt can't get up and follow you? That's what yeah. Brian Asman is saying. <laughs> Fuck you! It certainly can. Um, get where's up my and- Montana hauntings, Paris? Yeah, where, where's where my are- like Great Lakes haunted like boathouse or something? Right? Like, where is my haunted barn? is the question <laughs> where are my where are my ghost horses this is another question i have is we like, had a ghost karnaki gave us a ghost horse paris let's be clear <laughs> no that was a person in a horse costume spoiler <laughs> true, alert um true. but like we've talked about this before and why can't books have other types of ghosts it's always humans you never get in ghost birds like there's no ghost birds fucking keep me up at night like there's no ghost cats there's no Nothing. It's always people. It's only people. Ghost mouse. Ghost raccoon. He just wants your trash. I mean, if he could actually make that trash disappear, I would welcome a ghost <laughs> raccoon. Be like, yo, man. Good. I guess, you know, speaking of, like, we're all talking about, like, original monsters and hauntings. I kind of want to take an idea that you had just a moment ago, Paris. The haunted nachos is an intriguing concept. A haunted nachos? You said, like, give me that chips and guac flavored, like, in the haunting. Walls? And, and yeah. Now I'm, yeah, like, I'm thinking literal haunted nachos. Like, you ingest the nacho and you, get, oh. you are possessed. There was, like, oh. a, a haunted batch of guacamole or chips <laughs> or something. Someone fell in at the factory and died, and this was distributed amongst. You know the nation or something like that. Haunted food, man. Like I think sure. haunted food exists, isn't? Uh, there, uh, the movie The Stuff. I think is is haunted food. Anyway, uh, yeah, get more creative with your haunts, like Brian Asman. That's sorry, that was a huge tangent. I don't even remember what the fuck I was talking about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was, How about I was, a oh, banshee? I'm sorry. A banshee that can only screech through electronic means. That's my other pitch for you. I mean, that's just a noise artist, Chris. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, sorry, everyone in my life who's a noise musician. Uh, that's just noise. Um, I'm sorry, I got off on such a tangent here, but thank you for not for not um, setting this in New England and having a haunt somewhere else in the Southwest, Jackson Hill. I don't know if it's supposed to be in Texas or Arizona or something. Um, something I would like assume that. from the Whataburger reference that it's supposed to be Texas-ish. Okay. Yeah, so anyway, uh, we were talking about, you were saying how this felt very Goosebumps-ish to me and I and to you, and I was like, no, it doesn't. I highly disagree with you. I find this whole idea extremely threatening, but I think that's just because I feel like I live in a house that does have a mind of its own and will kill me because <laughs> I live in a New England house that's 120 years old. Um, or 112, I don't know, it's something like that. So do you, though. You also live in mm-hmm. a house that's up there. Um And, you know, it's like I have the misfortune of uh, living in an apartment where the trees on the property are not, like, trimmed or anything. So it'll just sound like someone's knocking on my window and I live on the second floor. So that can be really unsettling. That's classic haunted house shit right there. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, right. It's just the tree. But, like, you know, you're just you just forget about that stuff sometimes. And then your house does things, you know, it creaks. Things are on very uneven in this house there's no <laughs> even surface in this home uh well, it's for the- starting to become lovecraftian after a while like how does this angle even meet here i don't understand. oh i mean that's what when i lived on the third floor uh, i recently moved from the third floor to the second floor in the same building uh when i lived on the third floor we actually we used to call that um escher's attic because just it just looked like an mc escher painting of like stairs that don't go anywhere and angles that don't meet and yeah, it's truly a Lovecraftian horror up there, man. Like, you you just got impossible geometry all up in that place. Uh, but anyway, I yeah, I don't know. I thought this concept was actually scary. I didn't feel like this was Goosebumps-y because there were, like, real... Uh, I don't want to say there are no real consequences of Goosebumps books because as a longtime listener of the Goosebuds podcast, I 
I have gone through all of the Goosebumps books again, uh, at least through the through these reviews. Um, and there are definitely some of them where bad things happen, but like usually people don't die in them, and they're just like, "Don't be shitty kids." The book, you know. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, or you know, like, oh, a mo- wouldn't it be cool if we had monsters? Um, but yeah, so I don't know. I I see Goosebumps ish horror as like stuff without a lot of consequences that's really silly this but this seemed really scary people are actually dying like it's a problem yeah, true i mean there's like the house the consequences but i guess it's the silliness aspect of it that kind of made it feel that way for me yeah i don't know i think this would be a great like a great like uh you know like a black mirror episode or something like that i think it would be great sure. um it would be good televised if it was done well. But yeah, anyway, I thought it was a threatening concept because the whole concept is that like Sabrina's the one who likes the house the most and she spends the most time in the house because she's the stay-at-home mom whereas the kids are at school, the dad's off at work. And so the house kind of takes a liking to her and it's like, well, you're my new owner and you're the one that cares about me so I'm going to take care of you. And that's why it starts like leaving her wine and cooking her food. But then it... It just sort of takes things way too literally, and it's like, oh, your kids are annoying you. Time to murder them. Like, whoa, house, <laughs> chill, really? chill out, it was house. Cool when you were making food for me and everything, but like, that's a bridge too far. Yeah, and so the house is just like, no, my owner has to be happy, and it just can't. You know, it's a fucking house. It doesn't have. <laughs> I don't know. It, the thinking hasn't evolved. No one knows where this house demon came from, but. It doesn't have terribly complex thought processes, so all it's trying to do is make Sabrina happy, and it takes it way too far. Um, I mean, you know, and this is this is like we've seen this in other haunted house stories. Um, it was even in a a a, um, a Treehouse of Horror episode on The Simpsons. There was one where it's like a future house, and you know, but it's usually that though. It's usually like a future house. It's not usually like a present day, I don't know, just a fucking craftsman like this house, you know, like a house you <laughs> yeah. order out of a Sears catalog. Yeah, that's a, um, that's the other twist, right? Is that it's just a very, you know, mundane run of the mill kind of thing. Yeah, it's not like, oh, this old Victorian house with all these dead yeah. bodies in it. It's like, nah, it's a fucking craftsman from a Sears catalog. Like, I don't yeah. know what to tell you. <laughs> So, Paris, I think as millennials, we have to ask the question that's relevant to our generation. Which is, so you're out there pricing houses for the first time. Finally, you've received enough income to consider owning your own property. Oh, you mean someone in my my life died and left me money (laughs) or I somehow was able to get money from a horrible accident that happened to me. Yeah, the um, only ways you can dream of homeownership. The only ways. Or I somehow marry someone fabulously wealthy, yes. Sure. So we have to ask the question, how haunted of a house are you willing to move into for what pricing? Like, oh, what do you think is, like, oh, your cutoff? Extremely haunted. I mean, because, like, <laughs> I don't I don't think haunted houses are real. So, like, I, give, me your, give me your haunt. Like, actually, I just watched them. Um, <laughs> I was just watching... Um, american horror stories the little like one-off episodes that they did kind of in the same universe as some of the original series uh with with my friend tris and there was one where the quote-unquote murder house which is in the first season of the show and then in a couple of the episodes of the the one-offs is you know once again up for sale and it's always like no one ever wants to buy it because people just keep fucking dying in it and the the realtor says to this woman who comes to look at the house, he's like, he's like, well, the bank wants to sell it for land value, which is $600,000. And he goes, but no one's been willing to pay that. And she goes, $100,000? He goes, let me call them. I think you got a deal. And it's this enormous house in <laughs> LA. And it's like a hundred grand just because no one will buy it because people keep dying in it. Um, so like, that's really what I'm looking for. So if you have a house where people keep dying in it, uh, I will buy it for a hundred thousand dollars. So I'm telling you, (laughs) 
<laughs> what is your strategy to avoid being killed, though? Are you just walking in, like, full armor around the house all day? You don't have house shoes. You have fucking house armor that you're no, wearing. No, no. Um, my house plate mail. No. Um, <laughs> no, I would check the house for the common reasons that people die in houses. You got, you got um, black mold will kill you. You got gases coming up from the earth. That'll kill you. Um, what are the other things that will often just like silently kill people in the house? Uh, I don't know. I don't just know. like the, a nail in the wrong place and you trip and fall and it goes in your brain or something. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's that's like Looney Tune shit. But yeah, <laughs> I, I'm thinking more silent killers like carbon monoxide, gas coming up from the ground. I don't know what type of Okay, gas, well, let's go but... with like the American Horror Stories thing. Like how do the people die in that house? Oh, I mean, the ghosts are murdering them. Okay. Or they were so, murdering each other because the house inspired them to kill each other. Okay, so that's a strategy, right? Like, you buy the house for cheap, and it's only you in it. You're never allowed to be with someone else, so you can't, like, drive each other crazy with, like, you motherfucker, you keep leaving the dishes in the wrong in the sink all the time, and now my rage is heightened because the house is haunted or something. Well, you know what? The only person who escapes, this is a spoiler alert for uh, episodes one and two of season one of American Horror Stories... Once again, spoiler alert for episodes one and two. All right. Uh, The only person who actually lives in that house and is able to leave is a young woman named Scarlett who is a lesbian and falls in love with one of the uh, young lady ghosts in the house. Oh, that's so sweet. (laughs) And the young lady ghost has been dead long enough that she is able to emotionally... um, understand that if you love someone you have to let them make their own decisions because she was pretty intent on murdering scarlet to keep her in the house but then scarlet was like you need to let me make the choice she was like fine and then so (laughs) now the house learned yeah well well i mean they're all individual entities in the house but uh so you know she actually does which was shocking to me and uh now scarlet just comes back every year to visit her uh and you know, they. I feel like that would add dis- value to the listing, though, right? Like you could fall in love with the ghost in this. That's the way you spin it as also, the haunted house realtor. <laughs> also, the ghosts can use cell phones, so like. That's just helpful, right? Okay, uh, yeah, so that, I, as the realtor, I'm like adding value, like the the like especially if you have the house. Even in this story, it's making your food for you. It's murdering your husband for I mean that yeah. could be a plus for some people. Uh, actually, Chris, you are selling it. Yeah, that is a that is a plus for some people. <laughs> and actually, yeah, I come to think, the house in this uh book also could use cell phones. I don't really understand that part, but maybe it's just because cell phones are also connected to electricity and it seems like spirits have some kind of sure i think it's the, the thing where it's like you know you can't see wi-fi data packets so they're like in the same spirit realm as ghosts is like wow this works i like, mean that <laughs> yourself honestly, works like, in the spirit aether plane or something dude if ghosts are just packets i'm done I'm <laughs> they're just missent data bridge. packets from another dimension is what ghosts oh. are i mean that i hate to say this but that kind of makes sense <laughs> yeah I'm let's willing, go with that there's let's use this as a writing it. prompt someone come up with that story i'm willing to believe it at this point okay um, so we've determined that tbc is willing to buy your haunted ass house if it's yes. you know for an extremely low price perhaps you could even just you know flip the haunted house right like if you know if you're pretty sure it's haunted or there's some ghosts in there hire some construction workers do a little bit of the is, renovations is, on the outside the, of the house your own continuing with shit. continuing with spoilers for uh episodes one or two of american horror stories <laughs> that is uh that is the main that is the plot point in there so um all right yeah well, so cool. uh point is hundred thousand dollars sell me your haunted house sell me your haunted house for a hundred thousand dollars um Anyway, next next problem is we consume so much media where, like, there's always a protagonist or a character who's kind of the Cassandra who's like, man, shit's really fucked, shit's haunted, shit's going down, and everyone else is like, oh, man, Cassandra's really nuts, huh? And it's like nobody, and then Cassandra's like, am I nuts? You know, like, I don't, I don't no know what's really going sure. on. really sure. You know, Everyone's, so- like, all confused. We need a method, Chris. We need a method. <laughs> we need how a do you scientific know, way. How do you know if you're being haunted or you're actually losing your mind? We really, we need a solid method here. 
I think the first step you need to do is to determine if the haunting, if possible, could be captured on camera, right? Like, is this a situation where, for some reason, I guess despite Ghost being part of the, you know, digital realm or being Aether digital packets, does that also result in them not being captured on video feeds? Because if you can just simply, like, simply CCTV and cell phones, I think, are the way to, like, really determine the first step of this. No, I disagree. I think at fir- first you need to determine is the haunt following you or is it just in one place? Because mm. I think if you're actually crazy, you would be experiencing the bad jujus kind of everywhere, right? Whereas True. hauntings are usually location based. Not that that not that I have any rhyme or reason for that. We're just going with like horror movie logic here. They're almost always location-based or tied to an object, right? So, like, if you separate yourself from the place or object that is that you think is haunted and nothing happens to you, then you're not crazy. Something's haunted or fucked up or, I don't know, you got a fuse out or something. Um, <laughs> carbon monoxide leak, like, who knows? Um, okay, so, yeah, that should be step one is like, remove yourself from the location for a period of time to see if the hauntings continue. There are some ghost stories about, like, you know, an entity is chasing you down no matter where you go. That's true. So that's the, that's the first wrinkle you'd have to deal with. I mean, with. but that's more, of, that's more of, like, a demon and less of a haunting, right? Like, are we I mean, dealing I'm with... A- what kind of entity are we dealing with here? Is true. Yeah. That's like the first step is determining exactly what kind of thing is there. But I think the location based thing is definitely step one. And if it's still chasing you, then step two has to be determining whether that experience of being chased is something that can be empirically observed by other people. Yeah, yeah. Besides for sure. yourself. So you have to have someone that's willing to be chased is the thing. So we need some kind of like decoy person that has like, I don't know is willing to take on all of these chaste entity Oh my god, hauntings. Cr- Chris, Chris from Yusuit's monster Fleer. Yes, uh, so I, I'm, like... for a fee, I'm willing to be nomadic and move around the world at all points. I must be, I cannot stay in one place for more than a day or two, but if the price is high enough, I'm willing to take on your extra chasing haunting to see if it's really a thing that's also chasing me. First, Chris there's a deposit fee. will run fee. from your ghost for $100,000. <laughs> there's just a deposit fee just to see, you know, if it's actually chasing you or not. And then there's an extra fee if we determine that it is a real thing that is chasing me. Now you must give me the extra fee after that. I don't know how that would work. You know, once I'm being chased, it's chasing me. I'm just kind of fucked. So I know. I mean, you got to pay for the exorcist, right? Like, that's what the other fee is, the follow-up. True. You got to pay True. for a, you got to get a two for one, though. You got to get a two for one. <laughs> yeah. So this is our two-stage process, I think, is location-based okay. and then me being the decoy okay. <laughs> for the right price. If I, you know, if I have enough on me, if I have, like, ten ghosts at, like, I don't know, <laughs> it's, like, ten grand a year or something like that, then I could, like... That's, I don't know. I mean, depending on the nature of the ghost, like, if it's a real murdery ghost, that's a low price. Yeah, but, like, that, that's what I mean. Like, ten grand a year, I think I could... Ten grand a year is for your like harassy ghost that isn't going to murder okay. you. But if it's specifically a murdery ghost, <laughs> I'm bumping it up tenfold. It's a hundred G a year. Yeah, right. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. But only if it's a th- it's a being that cannot be exercised. If I'm like taking on this for the rest of my life, I want guaranteed funding to be able to move around at will, live in my fucking ghost fleeing van or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> that that van life. Ghost fleer. Um, <laughs> ghost runner. You're the ghost runner. That's. That's your that's your new title. Um, okay, so but like I still don't think that this method really eliminates. Well, what about a, what about a psychiatric evaluation? Just a straight up like. Sure, that should of, be part of it as well. Also, you know, just just to make sure that there's not anything that's classically presenting. I suppose in terms yeah, of psychiatric right. symptoms. Um, you know what else I would do is I would hire a private investigator to make sure that other people in my life aren't fucking with me and causing True. me to. So, OK, so we have like private investigator. We have psychiatric evaluation. We have location slash object removal. And then we have the ghost runner. So that's a lot of that's a lot of stuff. Holistic service, right? We're all yeah. points contact. Just really trying to cover all of our bases as much as we can. 
And, you know, perhaps also just a level of, like, we install cameras everywhere in, in this house or around you just to determine if there's something that be, can, can be caught on camera feed. Oh, right? you, know, you know what? No. I mean, we'd also have to hire a, a debunker, right? To take a look at the house to make sure, again, you're not, like, inhaling True. weird vapors or uh, you got mold in the walls or anything like that to make sure it's not, like, a, a physical issue with the house that isn't a haunting but it's like a or you know there's just like a secret passageway to a well where someone's living down there with a leg of mutton just yeah to- <laughs> you know like that's i mean that's you know the the leg of mutton dwellers are also a problem um <laughs> yeah there's so many things you gotta check i mean you might have a guy living in a well with a leg of mutton under your house carbon monoxide leak. vapors you know like so this is a it's a pricey service to be clear but if yeah. you really need to know you've got us TBC, Ghost Finders. Wait, no, no, not that one. No, no. Well, you're the ghost runner. That's uh, true. So, okay, so what? Okay, so steps in this process. I actually, all right, I think step one is having someone, a debunker come and check out the house. Mm-hmm. Make sure that the house isn't the problem. And then we move to, like, you being somewhere else away from the house or object that's a problem. Then a psychiatric evaluation then maybe Chris takes on the ghost running and and then finally um what was the final step I think it was either just a general psychiatric evalu- evaluation and perhaps like camera feeds all around oh, the area set, oh yeah you know he's up a camera oh private investigator yes private investigator is a good one maybe that comes a little earlier maybe that's like after the house sure. study so uh debunker comes and checks out the house uh private investigator private investigator evaluation. you that's know that's all up top yeah right so you had to then then we separate you from the house or the object then chris does the ghost running and then after that i think at that point we could determine if something was supernatural or not then we find an exorcist that's yes, the, that's, that's the method that's the we've given step. it to you yes we we would have to have that relationship set up at the start so that like if this is a thing that you need to have exercised then we can also have that set up for you like i said full comprehensive ghost finding and fleeing service here well and if you schedule the exorcism through us you get a 20 percent discount right yes, of so course, like I because mean, of our special relationship right um text fuck off ghost to 50123 <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. okay. So that's where we'll be launching that service on our Patreon at some point. That uh, is the uh, hundred thousand dollar a year tier. <laughs> make, yeah, the tier. Oh my God, I should just add that to the Patreon as a joke. <laughs> um, uh, fuck off, ghost package. We figure out your haunt. Um, yeah. All right, Paris. I think that's pretty much it for me. Uh, well, you you had a final question for me. Okay, so as a final sign-off, Paris, mm-hmm. would you want to see yourself on TV at all? Like the the ghost is or the house is doing in this? Uh, no. I mean, I think because like Sabrina describes that when she sees herself in these like fake, you know, possessed TV shows, that they're a better version of her. Like they're better looking and they're more successful, and that would just make me fucking depressed. Like I wouldn't want to see. A fake cooler version of me. I don't know. I don't think the version of Sabrina was cooler. It was just, you know, very stylized and like Instagram friendly, which could be cooler to a lot of people, but well, I don't know, she said objectively she was better, better. She said she was better looking and more successful. Like she had things going on for her and her arms were toned, like Michelle Obama or something. I don't know. I forget if that was the actual reference. As, yeah, made. I suppose if it's your personal interpretation of better that is being shown to you, that yes. would kind of suck. I right. don't like I, for me. Like I would like to fool around with that for like an hour. That would be. That, I'm sure I could like right now if I have enough, vi- you know, video feed data on me. Someone could deep fake it. Please don't fucking do that. <sighs> um, especially since there's really not enough video data on me to do that. I would think, but it would be fun for like an hour to see myself in like an episode of Game of Thrones or something. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that would be cool. I guess I'd be down. I'd be down to be in an episode of Game of Thrones. Uh, all right. Well, um, can we fix it, Chris? Okay. Well, I mean, for me, it's fine. I don't see much I could tweak in the book. It's an enjoyable short horror romp with a humorous bent that takes you two hours tops to read. I mean, maybe I might like it 
to lean a little bit harder into the humor, a handful more jokes, but it's fine without that too. So I I would fix nothing about this. Yeah, I I have very little to fix. I mean, I thought this was great. Um, the only I I think I felt maybe stronger about it than you did because you're just saying it's fine. I thought it was really good. I really I enjoyed this. Um, the only thing the only thing that felt like it needed a cut was uh. The random, there's a scene where, like, a random officer calls the National Guard and then shoots himself. It added nothing and felt like filler in a book that had no other filler, so I don't know. I mean, I'm assuming it was just a callback to that similar scene in other, like, tropey horror stories, but it just, it just felt like a waste of two pages, man. Just, like, yeah. I don't, I didn't need that. Also, look, I, I was very glad that this was not set in New England for a spooky haunted house. However, the author makes reference to J.R. Fluffernutters, and my dude, J.R. Fluffernutters, has to be a New England chain. It cannot be a New Mexico or Arizona or Texas. It's ours, you son of a bitch. You can't take our fluff. I live. The one New England thing that you will hold on to. live in the fluff to. capital. You can't take it from us. Uh, but yeah, that was weird. I was like, J.R. Fluffernutters has to be a New England chain. Like, what is this doing in the Southwest? Um, Someone's going to comment on this video with, like, there's actually a J.R. Fluffernutters in Arizona. And you'll be like, what the fuck? I mean, maybe. That could be true. Uh, but anyway, for those of you uninit- uninitiated, the Fluffernutter is a peanut butter and fluff sandwich uh, that originated here in New England. And um, fluff is a delicious uh, marshmallowy spread. Uh, a lot of people don't like it, but it's a pretty popular sandwich here. It's very sweet. I cannot believe that I was served this as lunch as a child, but here you are. Um, here we are, eating sugar sugar sandwiches for lunch. <laughs> How different is that from jam or jelly? That's all sugar, too. Yeah, but it's got fruit in it. This is, like, literally just sugar in it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Um, so no, so it's, yeah, it's like a peanut butter and jelly, but all the nutritional content has been stripped from it, except for sure. the peanut butter. Um, anyway, uh, Fluffernutters are great. We're, we're big fans here. I actually live in the, um, in, uh, the place where we have the Fluff Festival every year. So Fluff is near and dear to my heart. I actually don't, I don't love Fluff all the time. It's a very like once in a while kind of thing, but my partner is, uh, Fluff obsessed. He buys it by the by the crate, by the twelve count. Jesus Christ, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Paris. I'm concerned yes. about Tanner. I'm I'm not concerned. He's fine. He manages his blood the blood sugar. The, the ice cream levels alone, and now you're telling me he's buying fluff by the crate. Yeah, but he only he only eats Paris, absurd amounts you, of sugar once. Paris, in a great are you while. engaged to a living sugar cube? Are you being haunted <laughs> by a sugar demon? Yeah, I mean, he is kind of a sugar demon. Um, All right, we need to. See, okay, I, we we have to put this whole TBC. Yeah, we got to go through the process. Onto you. I'm sorry, Paris, but we, this is Shit. for your own good. Shit. Okay. Well, I guess we got to schedule. All right, we got to schedule the debunker to come to the house and check it out. Uh, they're gonna find a lot of things wrong with it, including exposed wiring, uh, uneven okay, flooring. Okay. Have you ever actually seen Tanner in a shower? Yeah, I have. Okay, just well, no, he's not no, dissolving. no, wait, wait, no. I mean, I've you've heard him. I've take a shower, heard. But have you seen I've him heard the shower underwater? turn on. Ba- have you seen him underwater? Oh well, we've been swimming together. Okay, is so, he covered in like a full body suit when he's swimming to prevent the moisture from touching his skin, perhaps? Oh yeah, you know the the, the swimming gimp suit. It's that's all the rage. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> no. Uh, so I don't think he is actually made of sugar or at least the sugar hasn't taken over his flesh yet okay, um, so we'll we will have to monitor the situation um yeah. until then uh thank you to our patrons thank you to dari craig veronica will especially will d jared arant senior Jakub, lycoris elliot kieran martin lucek miri yanka david anya patricia austin donnie crimson paladin beast with the least scott h robin laxtodes of the Void, the Taco Eating Unicorn, Last Man on Earth 01, Funny Robot with Antennas, Hobby Boy 93, our Kofi donor, Kiwi Thing, and our newest patrons, Harry, Mason, and Renee. Welcome to the Terrible Book Crew. And thank you, Brian Asman, for writing a pretty great short story that made me laugh, had a good time. Again, massaged my sad, tight, terrible book muscles. Thank you, Will, especially, for recommending yes. this. This was a fun time. 
um yeah it was just it was just an, a good experience and i'm glad we read it and uh yeah i would Me totally too. recommend this to anybody who's like into horror or who has a sense of humor i feel like i, I wouldn't mm-hmm. i don't know that i'd straight up recommend this to anyone because i know sometimes people can be a little squeamish but um i think if i knew that they had a tolerance for it i would i would totally recommend this this is a it's a good spook it's a good spook all right paris well um just bring tanner by the house sometime i'm going to just splash him with water and we'll just start checking out i'm very concerned for you but we can we'll, we'll make sure everything's cool okay yeah i mean maybe we can just put a horse next to him and see if it tries to eat him and then Pro. we'll know if he's a sugar cube okay well until then yeah we'll keep bye. exploring strategies for uh tbc's ghost runners uh just <laughs> all right paris bye all right H- happy october ween Thank you for listening to another episode of Terrible Book Club. Terrible Book Club is an independent podcast produced by your hosts, Paris and Chris. Sound design and audio editing by Chris, with sound effects and music by Epidemic Sound and sometimes also Chris. Our theme song is Kiss by Yearn, which is, you guessed it, actually, also Chris. You can find more of his soothing synthy sounds on Bandcamp at yearn.bandcamp.com. Do you want us to review a book of your choice on the show? Do you want access to some extra audiovisual weirdness? If so, become a patron at patreon.com slash terriblebookclub. If you'd like to send us a one-time tip instead, you can do that at ko-fi.com slash terriblebookclub. You can also support TBC for free by sharing the show on social media, following our accounts on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or Goodreads, telling your friends about your favorite episode, or by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or anywhere else on the internet. To send us book recommendations or your adorable pet photos, send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com.